Now, it is officially February and it is nearly, nearly JLT time or whatever they call it these days. Is it March? Is it JLT? I don't really care. Whatever it is, it means it's almost, almost officially the AFL preseason. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm starting to get pretty excited. Now, as you can imagine, with the season so close, we're going to be pumping out some 2020 season preview content. That starts with today, which is going to be a shorter video. Basically, I'm just going to be talking about each club individually. I'm going to identify one thing that I think they should be excited about going into this season. So I'm going to go with the traditional format and go alphabetically, starting at Adelaide and finishing at the Western Bulldogs. So first up with the Adelaide Crows, one thing I think they'll be excited about is the regeneration of all the youth on their list. It's something I've talked about a little bit this offseason, but obviously they've sort of languished after making the grand final. They finished like 13th and 12th or something like that off the top of my head twice and they've kind of they kind of struggled to get new guys into that team they've had the second oldest list i believe last season and obviously when you make the, we don't make the finals rather and have one of the oldest lists that is a really big signal for change but they went out and they were proactive they got Fogarty in that last uh the year before last galucci was there for has been there for a couple of years but guys like mackesy chase jones Ned McHenry, Josh Worrell, and Schoenberg are guys I've just picked up in the last two years. This is the time for them to actually get games. And I think under a new coach, we're going to see a sort of a new look Adelaide Crows side. And I think for fans who go for them, who have been, you know, seeing a team struggle outside the eight for a couple of years, I can imagine that change would be very exciting. So I'll just say... But the thing they'll be excited about is all the new faces and hopefully that can drive some sort of improvement. For the Brisbane Lions, I think the exciting thing for them will simply be that this has been the first time in a long time they've gone into an AFL preseason looking like premiership contenders. This year we saw them finish in the top two and while they went out in straight sets, I think we were all pretty impressed at the way they managed to actually find themselves in the top two. Now, I think a lot of people, including myself, thought that maybe that was a little bit early for Brisbane. I thought they were gonna be a couple of years off actually contending for a flag, but they made their way to second, as you can see. And I think what they've got is a really good blend of experienced players playing really well and good up and coming youth. And I think that's a really, really good sort of dynamic for their list. They've got quite a few young players in the right age to really take the next step. Guys like McCluggage, who obviously improved a lot last year, Cam Rayner, Jared Berry, Alex Withen, and these guys guys are right at that right age where you don't have to wait too long before they're probably going to start hitting their prime. But anyway, the simple answer is for Brisbane, they'll be excited that they've probably got an, at least another finals campaign ahead of them this season. For Carlton, the exciting prospect will be simply taking the next step. Now, obviously, they haven't played finals since 2013. I think they finished sixth that year. And since then, they haven't finished higher than 13th. And that included two wooden spoons. They've regenerated a lot of youth, cycled through a few coaches. Uh, but I think I think there's reason to believe they finally got the mix right, looking at the way they ended the season under Teague. There's a lot of optimism there, um, and justifiably so. But also, they've got a lot of young talent they've got to get games into. Guys like Walsh, Stocker, O'Brien, Kemp, and Philp were all in the last couple of years in the draft. Obviously, Sam Walsh had an amazing year last year. But uh, that will be exciting for them. But I think it's also the guys like Wiedering, Plowman, uh, SPS, Fisher, to name a few, there's more on the list there, that are probably actually like Brisbane in the right age to actually start improving. So long story short, I think Carlton will be excited this year because this is the year they're supposed to start moving up the ladder. I don't think they're going to play finals, but nonetheless, I think with all that young talent on their list, it is still an exciting time for them. Next up is the Pies, and they are a hard club to actually pinpoint one thing that's exciting for them. I think mostly just the fact that they're most likely going to be another contender this year. In fact, in my recent rankings video, I have them as one of four teams that I consider a genuine premiership contender. Their hands have been tied a little bit by the salary cap. They haven't really recruited too heavily in the last couple of years. So you could argue the upside going into this year is a little limited. However, Jaden Stevenson will come back and presumably, fingers crossed, play a full season of footy. And that's a big upside for them. I think Stevenson is a really important player for their dynamic because obviously in the absence of a true key forward who bangs home a lot of goals, they rely heavily on Majacek and Goey. And then Stevenson really adds that third string to that bow to, uh, they really need some goal scoring power. It's really important for them. So uh, I would say the Stevenson is the upside, but the main exciting thing for them is I think they're going to feature heavily in September again next year. Essendon is probably the hardest club to think of for this. And I'm probably going to get some flack in the comments for saying that if they don't make finals, that's a massive fail. 
but I, I can't see them finishing too much higher than say six or seven. So we also with the transition of a new coach out this year, I think it's gonna be kind of an awkward year for Essendon and I've said that in my predictions video. However, if I'm gonna pinpoint something to be excited about, one thing they can definitely be happy about is the return of Devin Smith. He only played seven games in the 2019 season and uh, obviously wasn't playing to his usual capacity. In 2018, he I think he was a leading tackler in the league, uh, and I think he was, it was at 8.5 tackles a game, which is incredible. And I think if they get that sort of intensity back into their side, um, you know, he's probably one of the more important players. So I think that is one reason to be excited at Essendon. Fremantle have obviously had a lot of adversity this off season. You had uh, Ross Lyon obviously being replaced by Justin Longmuir. So the excitement there is that there's a new coach and potentially a new era at Fremantle. They've also had some important players leaving like Brad Hill and Ed Langdon who are two important midfielders for them particularly Brad Hill now there's talk of Jesse Hogan leaving but I won't touch on that too much because we don't know exactly what's happening there but I would say the exciting aspect for them uh, other than you know the whole new era thing would be the fact they've picked up three top 10 picks in the draft in particular I expect Hayden Young to feature very highly in this year's Rising Star Award I think he's ready to go and uh, even though Fremantle's backline's settled, I think that Hayden Young will come in, play most games, and be a very good player. So I, I think while there's a lot of adversity at Fremantle right now, there's plenty of reason to be excited, and guys like Chera and Brayshaw as well taking the next step, um, there's, there's reason for optimism there. Geelong were another club for whom it was hard to find a clear answer, I thought. As far as I'm concerned, I think this is Geelong's last year, their last roll of the dice. They finished top of the league, obviously, in 2019. I thought, actually, just, they probably deserve to be grand finalists. It probably should have been a Richmond Geelong grand final on merit. Obviously, they played each other in the finals. I've said this in the past. I think they re rely a little bit heavily on their mature talent, their existing sort of older generation, guys like Dangerfield in particular. I don't necessarily think Dangerfield will slow down. Uh, he obviously had one of his best seasons last year, I thought, in my opinion. But I think the fact as well that Tim Kelly's leaving, or has left rather, and his replacement Jack Stephen is already injured, I think that's a bit of a blow. So if I had to pinpoint the exciting aspect for them, I would say it's the emergence of guys like Parfit, Constable, Radigalia, Grian Myers, and to name a few, there's more than that, who are really the, really the sort of players they need to step up now to sort of ease that transition from this generation into the next generation that's gonna take Geelong forward. Geelong have done a really good job, I think, of stockpiling the talent while they've still got their older players on the list but now is the time for them to sort of give those guys an opportunity to make, to make the transition even better. Gold Coast are another side who uh, have a lot of adversity thrown at them all the time, but from, from where I'm standing, this is the most exciting time for Gold Coast fans, probably since they started, in terms of the talent they have available on the list. The go five guys in particular that they've taken high in the last two years would be Isaac Rankin, Jack Lacocious, Ben King, Matty Rao, and Noah Anderson. Obviously, we know we didn't actually see any of Rankin last year, so there's a lot of upside there. They also took guys like Flanders and Sharp early in this year's draft, or last year's draft, rather. Um, I think this is, yeah, like I said, this is probably the most exciting time in terms of the actual pool of talent at Gold Coast. It, it's arguably the strongest it's ever been because obviously that first batch of talent didn't really come on, or were they purely different? poorly developed maybe that's a different debate altogether nonetheless I think this is um, this will be more interesting than ever I think as a neutral to see Gold Coast play this year so I'm definitely going to try and catch a few more games than I maybe did last year to contrast Gold Coast so heavily we're going to go GWS next the other expansion team and I think the exciting for the thing for them is that this is probably the start of a golden era down at GWS and maybe that's a big call but I think making the grand final last year was their their big step into becoming one of the big boys now it'll be interesting to see as I've said countlessly on this show uh, exactly how they sort of come back from getting belted in the grand final that was probably the worst probably the second worst grand final performance other than Port in 2007 I'd have to say what was it like 90 points 89 points or something like that so uh, but nonetheless mostly ta most talented list on paper um, and they, they had some injury battles last year as well, but add to that as well, they've just had a two top 10 picks in Lockie Ash and Tom Green, and I don't think we're actually gonna see too much of either of those players, maybe Lockie Ash because of his sort of playing style, but long story short, this is the period where GWS's main guys like Cameron, Whitfield, Cornelio, Toby Green, I could go on, are actually starting to hit their prime now. They've got plenty of years left, so uh, exciting times for GWS. Next up is Hawthorne, and this is another tricky one for me, actually, to pinpoint one thing. On the one hand, Will Day was their earliest pick since 2006. 
I believe. So this is the first time in quite a while Hawthorne's had a re relatively high draft pick for them to actually develop and put some real thought into. Uh, but I don't think that's going to be the answer. I'd say the, the, the true answer to this question is the most exciting thing for Hawthorne will be the return of Tom Mitchell. I think a lot of their fans and well, I guess the AFL community generally will be thinking how good are they with a fit Tom Mitchell back? Obviously there's question marks. Will he return to his best straight away? It was, sounded like a really horrific injury that he sustained. So I'm not too sure. But nonetheless, you'd think they'll surely improve with him. I think they'll play finals but it'll be interesting to see to what extent they really improve with him back. Next up is the Melbourne Demons, and I think the, the simple answer for this is that 2020 has to be better than 2019. It cannot possibly get worse. I mean, they could win the spoon, but I really don't think they will. I think it was a horror year for them. Everything went wrong. From the start of the preseason, they had injuries, and the club kind of imploded on itself. But I will back them to at least improve a moderate amount. Whether they play finals, I'm not too sure yet. But the talent is there, it's obvious, and uh, and they obviously made a prelim just two years ago. So they can get over the psychological demons, which I've talked about previously. Um, and they've also got a couple of youngsters coming up. Luke Jackson may debut early now if Gorn's injured like I believe he is. Um, I think there's plenty of reason for Melbourne fans to be excited just on the basis that it can't possibly be worse than last year. <laughs> Next up is North Melbourne, and I was intrigued to see that Champion Data actually rated their list top six in the competition, which I found pretty surprising. Now, Champion Data is famously misleading. You shouldn't take everything out of it, but I was still quite, I still found that quite a surprising endorsement on their list, which I would have thought was more middle of the road. I guess the exciting aspect for North this season would be seeing the younger guys, because there is, there is plenty of young talent on the list, take more slack from the experienced guys, particularly in the midfield like Higgins and Cunnington. They're no youngsters anymore. Uh, many of guys like Simpkin, but I think the, the main guy I want to see this year, the main source of excitement for me is Luke Davies Uniac. As far as I'm concerned, he's still one of the best talents from his draft, which was a pretty strong top 10 in particular. But I think he actually really does have the potential to be a future superstar of the competition. This is his year to improve. He, not necessarily, you know, win a Brownlow medal or anything like that. But if he can start taking more slack from the guys, from the shoulders of guys like Higgins and Cunnington, that would be a big success. So I'm excited to see how he plays this year and North fans should be too. Next up is Port Adelaide and the simple answer for them as well is the fact that they've brought in so much youth over the last couple of years. It's going to be really exciting to see how they develop. Last year they had guys like Rosie, Dersma, Butters and uh, I think Willem Drew all debut early. Obviously Connor Rosie finished the year really strongly, finished second in the Rising Star. They've added three top 25 picks or is it four top 25 picks this year um, with Jackson Mead being the father son. But long story short, I think they're in a good spot because they've got a lot of experienced talent to sort of nurture this, sorry, experienced players around this talent to nurture the players that they're developing, uh, which I think is really important. You don't wanna have just kids in the team. So I think they're in a good sp spot in terms of their list demographic. And I'm also looking at that forward line in the future. Guys like Connor Rosie, Miles Bergman, Dylan Williams, and Mitch Georgiatis are all real X-Factor players, and they're all gonna be crammed into that forward line in a couple of years. So um, that is very, very exciting future forward line potentially for Port Adelaide. And also the fact that Ken Hinckley is on a clear ultimatum this year. It's gotta be finals or bust, and that kind of pressure may see him sink or swim, and I think that's kind of exciting for Port Adelaide fans, depending on where you sit on the Ken Hinckley debate. Next up, we have the Richmond Tigers, and I feel like this answer is pretty obvious. The fact that they're in a position, in a really good position to go back to back. We've seen that they don't miss Rance too much. He didn't play much, or he played one game in 2019, and they won the flag with Dylan Grimes taking up that mantle and uh, performing extremely well. Um, I would say that they're, if I had to pinpoint the exciting aspect for them would be the upside of their West Australian Indigenous trio in Marlion Pickett, Sydney Stack and Shy Bolton. I'm really intrigued by these three guys. Obviously, you know the narrative around Marlon Pickett. He's played one game and, you know, what, he comes second in the Norm Smith or something like that. These guys all have genuine upside, and for a team as good as Richmond, that is genuinely scary. We saw Sydney Stack play to an incredible level in his first year, despite not even getting drafted into traditional pathway. Uh, and I also really think Shy Bolton is a real gun player of the future. So, um, genuine upside to their, to their list, which is, you know, really sad for a West Coast fan. <laughs> Next up is the St. Kilda Footy Club, and I think the clear answer to this one is the fact that they've recruited five best 22 players last off-season. 
St Kilda have always been a club that have kind of struggled to attract talent. I can't really think of too many big names that have made the switch to St Kilda in recent years, particularly when they've been out of the finals race. But they landed five players last year, including Brad Hill in particular, who I think is just about their best player, like I've said before. Dougal Howard from Port Adelaide is going to be a good fit down back for them. Uh, Zach Jones comes in his best 22 along with Dan Butler. And then also Paddy Ryder, who will only probably be there for a couple of years, you'd think. But nonetheless, I think all of those guys together strengthen their best 22. There's a new dynamic there, and this is the first full preseason that Brett Ratton's going to have with the squad, so uh, there's a lot of upside there and a lot of potential for optimism. While I don't necessarily have them in my top eight, this is certainly the best place St Kilda has been to push for finals in a number of years. Next up, we have the Sydney Swans, and although I rated them fairly low on my predictions this year because I think they're rebuilding, I actually think they have some of the most exciting talent in the league. First of all, you've got Buddy Franklin, obviously. Um, it looks like he's fit this year for a start, which is hugely exciting. But for me, on top of that, their youth in particular, guys like Ollie Florent, Will Hayward, Jordan Dawson, Blakey, McCartan, and uh, Dylan Stevens that they've just drafted as well. Obviously, you've got Heaney and Mills and Aaliyah Aaliyah and all those guys as well. That There's already a strong nucleus. That in particular, they're going to be one of the more exciting young sides to watch this season, in my opinion. In particular, Oli Florent, I think the way he ended last year, I reckon he's poised to break out next year, and I think he will become a very popular player by the end of the season. And I'm actually going to do an early shout for Dylan Stevens as my rising star. I think with his speed and outside skill, he's going to impact early, so plenty of reason to be excited at Sydney. Next up is the West Coast Eagles, and of course, we had the biggest recruit of the offseason last year, getting Tim Kelly. You'd look at the Eagles list and although it was very strong, the midfield was probably where it lacked the most, uh, particularly without Nat Nui. Now we're likely going to have a fit Nat Nui touch wood, obviously. None of those things are guaranteed with him. But to add Tim Kelly, who's probably one of the top five, top 10 midfielders in the competition to that midfield dynamic makes them really, really dangerous. Uh, I think that of it by itself is a really, really exciting aspect for the Eagles this year. The Bulldogs are another side who I found it hard to pinpoint one thing to be excited about. Obviously, during the offseason, they consolidated their tall stocks, adding Alex Keith and Josh Bruce. So they've actually plugged a couple of holes there. But far, as far as I'm concerned, they're a quality side already. That won't necessarily take them to the next level. I think this year is a chance for them to return to the side that they should have been after they won the flag. Obviously, they dropped out of the finals. They started doing a little re mini rebuild. I think their talent's good, but I also think the established talent there is good in terms of like, particularly their midfield, which I've banged on heaps about. I think if they carry their end of season form from last year into this coming 2020 season, there's a good chance we'll see them feature between that four to six range. So for me, I guess what I'm saying is the exciting aspect for them and their fans is that this is the year they should return to being a contender if everything goes right. But that's it guys, that's the 18 clubs and the things that they should be excited about going into this preseason. Let me know in the comments what you thought about what I said about your club and maybe some of your own thoughts as well. If you're new to the True Footy YouTube channel, make sure you hit subscribe. I'd appreciate it if you hit like on the video as well. And I'll see you all very soon somewhere on YouTube. Cheers.